we need to have very detailed discussion with the parents and the long term surveillance is needed so uh, this new catheter option is possibly available for sinus spinosis asds as pointed out by dr shak a long anchor is needed and with the lack of availability for a long covered ct stent in many parts of the world many of us we tend to use multiple overlapping 57 mm long andra stents but i would say that quite a lot of careful evaluation and surveillance is needed the basic difference between the even in an approach and our approach is that we don't have the privilege of using 3d printing virtual reality all the advanced sort of imaging that are uh, available with uh, the western world and very often we tend to resort to simple test balloon occlusion in the cath labs and performing this uh, procedure uh, so uh, there were uh, there were uh, a bunch of things asked was what is the size of the atlas balloon that you would will be using dr shak the uh, shak can you hear me hello can you hear me now yeah yeah no it was muted so uh, i couldn't say anything um size of the atlas balloon so what we do is we measure the size of the pulmonary vein right up a pulmonary vein uh on ct as well as angiogram and then uh, work out a balloon size about two at least two millimeters larger than those um uh, so if it's a 12 mm pulmonary vein would fit a 14 mm atlas uh, 14 mm pulmonary vein and 16 mm atlas so it's just larger than the pulmonary vein itself uh, okay one of the one of the problems about this uh, putting in an atlas balloon it is going to be pushing the covered stent anteriorly away from the edge of the sinus venosus asd and are you likely to get into more residual flows by this technique when you no, are no so so it produces an indentation on the stent uh, it's not massive indentation uh, maybe i went too quickly on the slide there was a little indentation but the bottom end uh, flared uh, closed the residual shunt so the pulmonary vein was protected ஒர்க்கிடிப்பிரிண்டிங்ஸ்ட்ரேஷன் madam the same question was asked by dr sauru gupta also that is sinus venosus we always have got the overriding of the superior vena cava yes. the basic principle of this technique is that you are pushing that overriding upper margin of the septum posteriorly so that you are getting an occlusion dr shak your views yeah correct and because the atrial septum is a little bit more mobile and so it, it gets pushed back yeah yeah what one more question that has come up uh, dr shak will be when you are doing a transeptal puncture won't you have any difficulty with the presence of an asd i will remodel the question uh, you see basically when you are doing a transeptal puncture and pushing in a sheath again you are pushing the atrial septum posteriorly towards the left atrium thereby creating a lack of opposition of the upper edge of the sinus venosus asd against the posterior wall of the covered stent in fact this is one of the reason why we continue to go retro retro arterial in all our approaches and we shy away from doing the transeptal puncture unless there is a pf uh yeah so what happens is once you've got the sheath through and you're pointing it towards the right upper pulmonary vein the septum actually moves back uh, just because of uh, the forces so it moves back into the position that it was in uh, before so that that has not really caused a problem to us okay there there are some of questions about role of anticoagulation therapy in the post operative period and another question was was there any stent thrombosis uh, two of two two uh, linked questions what is so uh, in our because uh, we do the cts and mris uh, there have been no stent thrombosis we've not used there was one patient in whom anticoagulants were used because he was a patient who in fact the first or second one who had 
previous surgery for sinus venosus defect uh, had a pacemaker implanted and so he uh, was on anticoagulants for thrombosis uh, related issues anyway so in him we, uh, we put a covered stent and put a patient on anticoagulant otherwise it's aspirin and clopidogrel for two months combined and then aspirin alone for six months and really that hasn't been a problem yeah we too follow the same thing there is also another question which you have already answered partially many of the sinus venosus asds have got an additional upper pulmonary vein that is draining high into the superior vena cava and what do you do already dr shak has answered it sometimes it is being left behind and in one of the patient where he showed that it created a two is to one shunt also surgeons also knew that i think dr shak has already answered that question uh, which patients do you completely exclude dr shak um, well, the main ones have been uh, uh, the if the right upper pulmonary vein is really very big uh, and it's draining high up, where the surgeons say, well, we would uh, do a modified, uh, not necessarily a warden procedure, but uh, widening the SVC and redirecting that vein, then uh, if the surgeons tell us they would do that, then we exclude them and send them to... Uh, uh, one question from Saurav Gupta is bilateral superior vena cava good for you or bad for you? <laughs> uh, the bilateral superior vena cava is okay in that the right SVC is going to be not very big uh, and therefore uh, you could potentially use uh, other stents as well to um, uh, close the defect. So it actually doesn't do it's neither an advantage nor a disadvantage. In fact, in fact, if I get a bilateral superior vena cava and there is only a single smaller right superior vena cava, I am very happy because I'll be able to use an 8 zig yeah. covered CP stent rather than a 10 zig covered CP stent. And it is quite fortunate that many of the patients with sinus venosus ASD will have double SVC. Mm. And this may be actually be favorable for some of the patients. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bharat, any questions from you or Biswajit, any questions from you? I am looking at all the questions from the chat box and asking them. You know, there is a constant question about sinus node dysfunction. Okay. It has been answered. That interviews on sinus node. We've, uh, we do a halter monitoring between six months and a year. And so far in our experience, uh, it, and that's pretty much it, all the patients have had these now. Uh, except those that are less than a year since the procedure, and we've not found any evidence of sinus node dysfunction so far. Uh, uh, actually, I, I had a review of some of the surgical literature. Most of the instances of sinus, sinus nodal dysfunction arising from the surgical sinus venosus ASD closure is because the vasculature comes from the epicardial region where there is a looping around of the either anterior or posterior looping of the sinus nodal and which is included by the surgeon in the epicardial surface. Since the covered stents are approaching it from the endocardial surface, the chances of injury to those vessels are possibly not there. And that is one of the reasons we have also not found any sinus nodal dysfunction in any of our patients at all. Uh, she had, uh, uh, oh, go on, Bharat. Yeah. No, I had just a, a couple of questions. Uh, one was uh, the question regarding the azygous vein. Because when you made your presentation, Shaq, uh, I heard you say something about the azygous vein. Does it really matter whether uh, you spare the azygous vein or otherwise? That was one question. And the second question I had is that, do you have any thoughts about using self-expansion stents instead of... Uh, Balloon, uh, balloon expandable scans. Okay, very good questions. Um, one is azygous vein we use as a landmark uh, at the upper end. Um, so it's we're less worried about either blocking it or um, doing anything, but it's a useful additional landmark uh, when positioning the top end of the stem. Um, so on fluoroscopy, we work out where the azygous vein is and where our right upper pulmonary vein catheter uh, is and then we work out the landmark related to the azygous vein. It's purely just for making the procedure easy. Uh, and the second question was, um, sorry, Bharat, uh, self, my mind. Self expandable. Oh, self expandable. Yeah, the problem with self expanding is that self expanding stents are, are 
really uh, predetermined to a particular sector. So whilst at the top end, you could work out the diameter in terms of it will be compressed, it's the bottom end where you have to flare individually and you can't predict how much flaring you have to do. And if the uh, self-expanding stent is of say 26 millimeter diameter and you need to flare the bottom end to 30, even if you flare it, it will recoil back to um, its predetermined diameter. And so, so why not? No, my question to you is, Shaq, why not universally use a 40 millimeter self-expanding stent? Yeah, yeah, um, possible. Um, again, length would be an issue, but um, haven't thought of. Um, yeah, I mean the length would be an issue. And, uh, because what I be. what I see from self-expanding stents, many of them don't shorten as much as the balloon expandable stents. I may be wrong, and I'm open to correction. Yeah, uh, it's not the shortening; it's the expansibility uh, that you uh, try, trying to expand to oppose to the septum. There was an experience by Matthew Crystal from uh, uh, New York where uh, he started off with a uh, yeah, 40 millimeter uh, uh, self-expanding stent graft. Uh, he could not get a proper opposition of the lower end and so he landed up a second stent. And then again, he could not get a proper opposition of the lower end and so he put in a third. Uh, this was after a 3D printing. So one of the reasons was that the lower end sort of folds and it does not come into a circular shape. And in fact, he presented this paper as a wedding cake solution in catheterization and cardiovascular interventions about two years earlier. And uh, like you, you need to have a self-expanding stent which is having extremely high levels of radial stress because the upper end is constrained and the lower end should not fold inside. If it folds, then the whole uh, occlusion will be affected and you have a lot of residual flows. In that particular paper of Dr. Uh, Matthew Christian, he had put in three stents. That means three stent grafts, uh, starting from top, going down to bottom. So probably a lot of bench testing needs to be done on these uh, 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 covered stents. Uh, sorry, well, stent one, uh, one area that I'm sure there will be plenty of questions mm. on is uh, the use of this procedure in children. And we uh, stayed away. I think if we were to do children, we would recommend doing mid-teenage years patients who have almost, almost reached the full growth potential uh, rather than um, much younger ones where we really don't know what will happen to the stents when the, when the patient's growing and then when you have to redilate them. So uh, uh, I would just emphasize that although it can be done, uh, that we would avoid, uh, uh, unless the patient was a, a 13, 14 year old that was nearly fully grown. Jack, the reason to ask you about self-expanding stents was exactly this, that if we could, uh, if we could design a self-expanding stent, maybe in children, uh, the self-expanding stent, because of its memory, could probably grow along child i don't know whether it will but it could uh, uh, if we interesting thought but i think at some stage this um, stand is going to lose its memory to keep expanding with the growth Jack, one interesting question that i'm finding have you observed when ppfe patch rupture when you are dilating and flaring the lower end of the uh, stent and creating a large residual shunt, like the PTFE fabric ruptures. Yeah, so we've not had the rupture, but we've had, uh, which I showed an example of in my talk, uh, where the, uh, we worked out the fact that the covering had moved upwards um, off the bottom end of the stent. And so uh, uh, we then had to overlap with another covered stent. The Tenzig covered CP stent can be dilated up to about 32, 34 millimeters uh, without tear of the covering. The eight zig tears at around 24 millimeters. So, uh, uh, but more likely it's the movement upwards, retraction, when you flare at the bottom end that uh, might occur. There is an interesting question from Turkey, Dr. Cancer, and he's asking, is, there, is it a cost-effective procedure for you? Like, what is the cost of a sinus venosus ASD covered stent exclusion in UK versus a surgical correction in UK? 
Uh, well, in terms of cost, um, firstly, these because this um, uh, met uh, capita method is undergoing evaluation, uh, the cost is obviously much lower uh, because the company is uh, sponsoring it. Uh, but even if it wasn't, I think the cost is going to be fairly similar um, for us uh, because. The patients are out within uh, after one night, uh, possibly two nights stay. Uh, there's no need for intensive care. There's no need for intubation. So there are all sorts of areas where the costs can be saved. Shaq, I would say in, in, in India, in the private sector, a yeah, sinus venosus HD cover stent will cost two times as expensive as uh, surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so now uh, we are almost five o'clock. So since the, the Ramadan uh, uh, fasting has to start in another one hour, uh, can, I, can we go on to the next part of this session? Uh, uh, Dr. Bharat, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go with case presentations, please. Yes, so we have, we have a few case presentations. We request all the presenters to be very brief so that 6 o'clock all the uh, uh, Islamic friends will be able to take part in their religious activities. Dr. Saurav from All India Institute, Delhi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva, and thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, hello, Dr. Shakil. It was a very nice presentation, and uh, I think it will be very difficult to follow both the presentations which we just had. So, uh, with the permission, I'll just share my screen, and I'll move on to the presentation without taking much time. So, uh, uh, since uh, we have been discussing, I'll just take this opportunity because we have seen systematically 100 patients of uh, sinus venosus ASD on CT. And uh, this is the pattern which we uh, see sometimes that this is the SVC in the presence of bilateral SVC. And then uh, this is a kind of uh, override EC. And that is why I asked that question. Uh, maybe it has been already answered, so I will not go there. Now, the next one, uh, this is the virtual section. Uh, some people were writing in the chat box, so I just thought that I'll include one of those uh, images. Uh, this is created from CT, and uh, this shows the uh, natriosphere sinus venosus defect, and the red arrow shows the anomalous pulmonary vein, and its relationship with the defect. And this is a so-called normal pulmonary vein, leading directly into the uh, left atrium. And uh, this is this uh, looking from the top, it shows how the SVC is overriding onto the septum. It's almost like 50% override with the atrial septum. The true atrial septum are demarcated by the star uh, in the middle. So uh, such kind of imaging, uh, although it doesn't give you the exact perspective of what will happen after putting the stent, the covered stent, but it gives you uh, what you want uh, in three dimension. And when it is rotated, it gives you uh, the left, right, depth perce perception and uh, the sort of things which may be required if you are planning for such a procedure. So with that, I'll go to what I thought that I'll share with the audience. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, many senior people over here and uh, the things which I may be showing uh, are not so useful, but it uh, possibly will be useful for some of the people uh, in the audience. So it was a 10 year old boy, 21 millimeter ASD, 24 millimeter ASO uh, being planned under transesophageal guidance and repeated prolapse in your aortic region. And this is what uh, was happening repeatedly. So since I didn't want a single case in detail, I just uh, clubbed two, three cases. And if you see uh, carefully in the middle panel, the device is actually, uh, we, are, we are trying from right upper pulmonary vein and towards the end, if you see the uh, angiogram, uh, it shows that the device is taking some cobra uh, type of deformity. and it prolapses. So repeatedly it was happening. And uh, so here uh, it shows that there is tendency to form the cobra here. And so we were, uh, I mean, I was doing the procedure and I was concerned about uh, what is to be done. And uh, in the next tense, instance, it actually happened that the device took the cobra shape, cobra head deformity. But then as soon as this uh, was uh, being taken out into the right atrium, this was getting uh, improved on its own. So I just want to show over here that I use the same uh, cobra head deformity just to deploy the device across the septum. 
and uh, this cobra had actually helped in uh, retaining the left atrial discs towards the left atrial side while the right atrium was uh, being deployed so this case i'm just sharing so that uh, we realize that cobra head deformity unlike what we used to understand earlier is the problem with the device it is most of the time related to the manipulations which we do and the uh, the sheath and the device uh, mismatch so it's not always a bad thing most of the time it is a benign thing and if you can take care of it most of the time we can manage uh, uh, having a good uh, outcome with these patients now coming to the next one five month old male infant pulmonary atresia with inter intact septum tripartite rv we planned for pulmonary valve perforation using coronary wire meant for cto and this was the angiogram and as you would realize that the pulmonary valve is very well formed right at ventricle is also very well seen but the problem is usual that the right jr catheter was lying very eccentrically and as soon as you push the cto valve perforate it will displace the catheter and we were not remaining close in fact we perforated eccentric satya we can't hear him is it is it better now sir yeah, now we are now you are much better okay so uh, yeah. the uh, the jr catheter was again and again getting the eccentric location and we were not able to uh, get that courage to perforate once we tried we went into uh, the pericardial space so we had to uh, stay back so we used this micro catheter to bridge this gap between the pulmonary valve and this uh, uh, catheter and once we use this micro catheter as you would see this micro catheter was sitting right at the center of this uh, uh, pulmonary valve and it allowed a perforation of the valve right at the center and the micro catheter is sitting here the catheter is lying so much away it gave us the handle and the courage to enter into the pulmonary valve and this is a simultaneous echo which shows us shows that uh, we are actually entering into the pulmonary valve through the center and we are not making an eccentric hole which would lead to uh, progressively increasing pr later on now this micro catheter also allowed us to get into the pulmonary artery and then exchange the cto wire which is usually unsafe and can create perforation in the pulmonary artery with a softer wire and it gave us another uh, way of handling the situation in much better way and then the procedure was easy we first dilated with coronary balloon and then with the tyshek balloon and uh, the results were as we wanted so uh, this is how it worked so if you see in this so the micro catheter is lying over here and whenever we were pushing the catheter was going back here but ultimately we could bridge this gap and we we have done this in like uh, three four cases and all the time it works quite fine and this is another report which has shown that in in similar five cases they could use micro catheter with uh, with good outcome so i think this also can be used uh, in in some cases where we are finding it difficult to reach to the uh, correct position while perforating because all these kids are small and uh, these are potentially dangerous uh, uh, cases now the third one is a 29 year old man with a underwent successful ASD device closure using 30 mm ASO under TE under GA guidance uh, under GA and there were not more than usual difficulties routine echo after 45 minutes in the ICU shot the device is in situ but the patient has developed pericardial effusion act was 150 uh, and uh, we initially did not realize what is happening and then later so this is just our own experience and uh, since i don't have images from that experience i'm just sharing this image so this is just to demonstrate why why it happened in our case and uh, since it is perfectly uh, Uh, was published in this letter to editor in Nagnal Super Pediatric Cardiology. This shows that what should not be done when we are uh, releasing the device uh, from the cable. Uh, if you see in the upper, this is from the uh, journal itself. Once we are releasing, the sheath is facing towards the lateral wall of the atrium, and the cable is quite outside the uh, device. And uh, this might uh, have a flipping onto the right atrium and can actually perforate. while look at this uh, example where the sheath is facing towards the medial aspect or towards the septum and the sheath is very close to the hub of the device and so if we are careful about this some of these preventable things can be prevented
So uh, this one is just a, a, a different case. It was seen in 2012, just to give a different sort of uh, approach to some of the cases which we now know and we know how to manage. So this patient at 13 years presented with exertional dyspnea with exertional desaturation at severe pH and saline contrast echo was positive with no intracardiac shunt. Now, they, there were no large PAVM, but there was suggestion of micro uh, pulmonary vascular uh, malformations. And this angiogram clearly shows what we are dealing with. So we are dealing with the uh, Abernethy malformation over here. And so we went ahead and defined the portal vein and we demonstrated that there is uh, portal vein radicals which are present. Now we know that it doesn't matter at, as of now, after eight years, we now know that having portal radicals of a reasonable size is not a mandatory thing to close such a uh, communication. And people have reported even in type one, you can safely close. But at that time, eight years back, we were not so uh, wise. So we took all the care. And so we labeled it as type two. We, we uh, like uh, uh, use this guide to think that, okay, if we close this uh, uh, communication, we'll be all right. We did test occlusion and over here, since it was very difficult, we had to do the cut uh, sheet uh, maneuver to direct it towards the uh, communication. Now, the bigger problem was it was a large communication and the choices were very limited. Device was almost out because of the practical reasons. So we were left with covered stent or a covered stent with fenestration. Now, at that time, we did not have courage to block the uh, communication completely because, because we were not sure where, how the patient will behave. So we, we opted for covered stain with fenestrated, fenestration in the IVC. But then the problem was that uh, the IVC was measured in 22 millimeters and the usual covered stains are not uh, in that size. So we ultimately had to use a stain graft which measured 28 into 82 uh, millimeters. We had to create a fenestration and we had to put a metallic, metallic clip just to make those fenestrations radio opaque. And once we uh, uh, did this procedure, and these clips were uh, oriented towards uh, uh, communication to avoid any undue increase in the portal hypertension, which might occur. Uh, at least that was that what uh, our thinking was at that time. And uh, this is what happened two months later. And this is the pre and post. And you would see that uh, uh, the uh, portal veins uh, have grown. So uh, this is all I wanted to share here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sarov. Uh, sort of different different uh, types of clinical uh, cases. Uh, Dr. Shank. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just wanted the, the first patient with the cobra deformity. I, I wanted to know your views on one of the papers by Dr. Bushra Rana, which stated that if you have a unduly larger sheet, then what is warranted? then the, the device tends to take a cobra deformity very frequently. What is your view on that? Yeah, the reason, uh, that's one possible mechanism. I don't think it's the only one, but uh, what we sometimes, it's a habit, isn't it? So when we use the screw type of device uh, and you push it in, if the sheath is larger, everybody's <clears throat> afraid of unscrewing so we tend to rotate the cable a little clockwise in, unintentionally. And that rotates the um, device a little bit if it's a, a bigger sheet. And that contributes to uh, cobra malformation. But it's not necessarily the only mechanism, though. That's the thing. Because even those devices that are, don't have a screw attachment, uh, just have a biotin type of attachment, like the Ocutex, that you can still get a cobra from those. Yeah, any other questions, Dr. Bharat? In fact, when Dr. Saurav was showing the pulmonary atresia, immediately Harmit Arora from Pune was writing microcatheter instantaneously. Quite a lot of operators will immediately take microcatheter in many, many patients with pulmonary atresia as a routine. Dr. Biswaji and Bharat, any questions? No, the only uh, comment I had was, uh, one was regarding uh, the cobra deformity was, uh, Many times this happens when you uh, reposition the device over and over again. And as Shaq said, if you rotate the sheath, especially with the device partly outside the sheath, you could probably you know, rotate the skeleton, which may have a propensity not to regain its memory. As regards the, uh, as regards the perforation of pulmonary atresia, 
really when we started we used to uh, use the hard end of the wide wire we didn't have the cto wires then this i'm talking about nearly 15 17 years back and uh, i remember that almost always we would get right up to the valve with the with the uh, right coronary catheter and what trick we developed was that we used to give some shape to the hard end of the wire so that when you take the wire there the catheter doesn't straighten up and look at the look at the roof of the right ventricle and by shaping the hard end of the wire we succeeded so i think a cto wire will definitely succeed if you go and have it against the pulmonary valve i have no experience with micro catheter in this there is uh, actually the uh, patient was 5 month old sir dr bharat Yeah. actually the patient was 5 month old and as you as the child gets older more than 3 4 weeks their pulmonary valves become thicker so the same thing which have works in uh, less than 1 month old child doesn't work the same way when the child is older so maybe that was the reason why we were uh, yeah. having more difficulty than usual in yeah, absolutely because i have no experience i, I have one comment yeah biswajit yeah Uh, what you can do is to exactly find the orifice in case of pulmonary valve perforation is you take another venous line and put a small snare uh, almost the size of the pulmonary valve expected pulmonary valve size and put it across and place it just below the pulmonary valve open up position and then uh, you get the idea where your exact pulmonary valve is and then you uh, puff it so that uh, leads to uh, avoidance of uh, pericardial injury in fact i would i would crossing through the ductus entering retrograde and putting in a small uh, 5 or 8 mm snare so that you will have a, a guide for perforation yeah, dr anand is already ready dr anand from jaydeva institute bangalore good evening everyone hello yes we are able to hear you anand yeah okay so i just want to present an unusual association uh, in a rare cause of pulmonary hypertension which we have to see so i'll just go through the case so this was a 23 year old lady who had complaints of exertional fatigue and dyspnea for the last 2 years and two episodes of hemoptysis over the last 6 months uh, she had been evaluated for these symptoms elsewhere including for pulmonary tuberculosis and uh, that was found to be negative So she was diagnosed elsewhere as a case of idiopathic pulmonary hypertension and started on uh, pulmonary vasodilators. When she came to us for a repeat examination, uh, she was found to be cyanosed with saturation of around 85 percent in all extremities with clubbing. Uh, she had a loud P2 and a pan-systolic murmur the lower sternal border, and unusually, we also noticed that she had uh, significant splenomegaly. So this was a chest X-ray of this patient. And as you can see, there is uh, minimal cardiomegaly, some right atrial enlargement, a prominent right descending pulmonary artery. Uh, the MP uh, appears uh, full over here, and uh, nothing particular on the lung parenchyma to suggest any uh, features of tuberculosis at least in this patient. So we did an echo on the patient, and as you can see, the chamber sizes looked uh, nearly normal. Though I would say that she was on uh, dual pulmonary vasodilators at this time. and as you can see the peak pr that we measured was quite insignificant and uh, there was no evidence of any intracardiac shunt so considering uh, that she had cyanosis and we didn't have any shunt to explain this we went ahead with a saline contrast and uh, this as you can see shows uh, bubbles of your appearing in the left side of the heart and that was obviously suggestive of a pulmonary avm in this patient so keeping all that together and also considering that we have uh, been thinking of uh, portal systemic shunts in this scenario of patients we were just imaging the idc and we could see a dilated portal vein with uh, a suspicious communication there so we had a patient with pulmonary hypertension whose etiology we were still working on she had pulmonary artery venous malformations and splenomegaly and portal hypertension had not yet been ruled out so we got a ct angio on this patient and as you can see here our suspicion of the uh, portal systemic communication was correct so she had uh, a kind of a, a end to side communication where you can see the confluence of the splenic and the superior mesenteric veins over here and she had a uh, left portal vein as radical which was well demonstrated and the right portal vein radical could not be well seen because that was exactly entering the ivc just after the confluence of the portal vein and uh, when we saw her uh, another thing which we noticed was the presence of uh, multiple aneurysms in the splenic artery 
and the largest measure, the largest one measured almost 3.5 centimeters. So we had a gastro consult done for her in view of splenomegaly with multiple splenic artery aneurysms. Uh, and we showed the deliver was of normal architecture. Uh, there were no gastrocephageal viruses. Our cell count and retic count were normal. No, no features of hypersplenism in the patient. So uh, we had two uh, procedures planned for her. One was a splenic artery occlusion. Uh, the reason for that being uh, presence of multiple aneurysms and an aneurysm uh, which is more than 2.5 centimeters has a high chance of rupture. And uh, the second thing we had to do was close the Abernathy malformation. So we decided to go ahead with the first procedure first in, uh, for the fact that uh, we then, uh, the pulmonary hypertension was anyway well managed on medications. And we wanted some time to actually put her off the pulmonary vasodilators and check her uh, PA pressures in the cath lab. And uh, thirdly, we thought occluding the splenic artery would get rid of the uh, photosystemic shunt flow because it decrease the, decreases the pulmonary vena, portal venous return and uh, the shunt fraction into the Abernathy would come down to some extent. So this, I think everyone knows uh, the way in which the uh, uh, photosystemic shunts actually are responsible for a lot of mediators from the gut which reach the pulmonary circulation and uh, cause changes in the lung microvasculature to cause pulmonary artery hypertension. So this was the uh, splenic artery uh, injection which we had taken. We had obtained first a femoral arterial axis and uh, this was hooked with the JR catheter from below. But if you see in this, we found that uh, the artery was quite tortuous and uh, the angulation of the catheter would have precluded us from getting into a stable position for delivery of an aid device. So we decided to come from the uh, right axillary artery in this patient. And uh, as you can see in the bottom panel, this was the, again, uh, multipurpose catheter injection. And uh, this seemed more coaxial. You can see multiple aneurysms which are noted here. Uh, another important concern here was the uh, sparing of the blood supply to the pancreas, which is important in all patients when you're considering a splenic artery embolization. So, we had a 5FGR guide catheter in place, and you can see the dorsal pancreatic artery coming off over here. So it's important to spare either the dorsal pancreatic or the greater pancreatic arteries, one of them to ensure uh, adequate pancreatic blood flow. And we delivered a 5 by 6 uh, ADO2 device. So we had the patient in hospital for a week, uh, looked for any other further complaints of any abdominal pain, checked her amylase levels, made sure she didn't have any symptoms of pancreatitis, and discharged her after a week. And we decided to stop the pulmonary vasodilators which we'd already stopped prior to catching this patient because the pulmonary artery pressures were, were around one third of the systemic pressure. Now she came back to us three months later. Uh, this The second procedure was delayed because uh, she had some financial constraints and needed some time to arrange uh, finances for the second procedure. So this is where you can see that she has an acutely dilated right heart with RV dysfunction and uh, she was ma managed with inotropes and he's started on sildenafil, a second procedure in the same setting. So this, as you can see, uh, we had again initially taken uh, both the model venous axis and the IGV axis uh, for the reason that we wanted to monitor the portal pressure. The portal radicals were already demonstrated on CT scans. We didn't have any concerns about that. And uh, as you can see, uh, this was a cook sheet, uh, which was brought from below with a multi-focus catheter to do that to measure the portal pressures. And uh, it was around 7 mm of Hg. And uh, this was the uh, ninth inch um, braided life tech sheet, which was uh, taken from the, light, uh, from the right internal jugular vein. And uh, the largest uh, diameter of the communication measured around 16 to 17 mm. So we had taken a 17 mm, uh, 20 mm uh, muscular VSD occluder and deployed it uh, at the mouth of the communication. Uh, now, once we had deployed it, we realized that uh, the disc uh, of the uh, muscular VSD occluder did not really sit on the IV side as, IVC side as we had expected it to. It had kind of gone into the uh, communication itself. And uh, though we know this is a venous structure and the chances of embolization are really less, we didn't want to take any chance. So what we did next was we uh, put in a self-expanding uh, wall stent, 22 to 70 mm and deployed it across that portion of the IVC so that the device does not migrate. 
three months later, the patient has been asymptomatic, saturating around 96% to Lumir. For ammonia levels, which were 75, three procedure had come down to around 54. Sildenafil doses were sequentially tapered. She was on dual uh, pulmonary vasodilators earlier. And as you can see in the repeat echo, the chamber size has almost normalized. Uh, there are very few micro bubbles still there, which are seen on the contrast echo, which we get repeated, and the device is seen in position. We stopped all her pulmonary vasodilators after six months, and we have an 18 month follow up on this patient. She is asymptomatic, there's no evidence of creation on the echo. And the ultrasound abdomen now also shows a normal spleen size of around 10 centimeter in the longitudinal dimension with normal Doppler flips. And this, I just wanted to emphasize her uh, ECG. So you can actually see a lot significant uh, RV hypertrophy with almost a QR pattern in V1. This was the time she presented to us sick in the ICU. And uh, this is her uh, post procedure ECG where you can see that the RV forces have almost disappeared. So the takeaways from this case were sinuses with pulmonary hypertension, the absence of an intracardiac shunt with reversal happening beyond the heart. Uh, earlier closure of carbonate malformations may prevent further vascular changes, though we still don't have data on long-term outcome in adults. And uh, though we try to ensure normal portal, portal pressures, at least some portal radicals have to be demonstrated prior to device release. As like Dr. Saurav said, the portal venous radicals usually tend to grow once we close off the shunt. And just a few uh, thoughts about the link between the splenic artery aneurysm and the photosystemic shunts. So photosystemic shunts, as we know, are congenital. Splenic artery aneurysms uh, have an onset later on in life, usually associated in females and especially with multiparity. And uh, splenic artery aneurysms uh, are a rare cause of splenomegaly. So increased arterial flow and uh, through the splenic artery, a dilated splenic artery does cause some of splenomegaly. That in turn can cause portal uh, hypertension, which was not there in our case more as a result of compression. An increased arterial flow through the aneurysmal artery would lead to increased portal venous flow and the portal systemic shunt would actually increase. We have not uh, come across any previous reports of the two conditions occurring together. And I'm not sure if there is any shared developmental basis or this was just a coincidence. Thank you. One question, uh, Dr. Anand. The, yes, sir. You had two lesions. So, why didn't you com complete both in uh, the first sitting? Yeah, so this was uh, basically because like uh, we were not sure of the splenic artery uh, embolization which we had done. We didn't want it to run into complications immediately after that. And as I said, uh, we thought let's kind of decrease the shunt flow into the portal, uh, portal venous return to some extent if it's possible. So that uh, we can kind of overwhelm the uh, hyperplastic portal radicals with an increased uh, flow when we try to just compress, uh, when we try to occlude the shunt. Hmm. And also the procedural time would have been considerable if we had to do both in the same setting. Okay. Thanks. My only question uh, to Shiva or Shaq is, uh, what is the uh, what is your experience or even uh, you can answer anand what is your experience about uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension reversal after uh, closure of photosystemic shunts in abernethy as against uh, reversal of uh, hypoxemia or the micro avms in the lung i was under the impression that micro avms are quite responsive but pulmonary hypertension is not all that responsive what are your thoughts yeah, pulmonary hypertension is likely to reduce in children if you treat this early, <laughs> but I'm not aware of what happens uh, to adult patients. So uh, I don't know. Anybody, Anand, have you seen any other patients? I so haven't age? seen any other patient, but in this patient, uh, there has been no recurrence after 18 months. So I'm not sure. Shak, uh, Jai, here. Jai Rangnath here. Yes, Jai, go ahead. Ah, Bharat. Uh, see, in the clinical setting of pulmonary hypertension, we have not done many cases actually. Mm -hmm. Most of them we have done is a AV malformation. Uh, probably this is the second case uh, in Jaidava which we have done. But what Nageshwara has done, one case has definitely come back with a significant pulmonary hyper arterial hypertension after three, four years. That patient happened to be seen by us in Bangalore. So we don't have a long-term data how many patients will definitely respond with kind of a closure of the Abernathy, we do not have a data. But there is a distinct possibility of, uh, we are not very sure that every uh, Abernathy, if we close it, we are not very sure that the PA pressure is not going to come back. We cannot answer that question. 
Yeah, because as a matter of fact, I heard this comment from Nageshwar himself. Yes, yes. In as fact, enthusiastic uh, about closing them in patients with severe pH as much as he was with hypoxemia. But yes. this patient has done brilliant. Yeah, yeah. This is 18 months. is a good follow-up. But yeah. we are not very sure what will happen to her also after uh, 5 years or 10 years. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks, Anand. Can we go ahead with the next case, please? So, good evening, everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, very much. Yeah, yeah. And your slides are also seen. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So, it's my honor to present a uh, case uh, in front of such uh, learned uh, people. And uh, my case is a multiple high risk stenting in the case of a single ventricle. And uh, before going to that, I must thank uh, Dr. Shakil Qureshi and Dr. Shiva uh, who acknowledged uh, our case in their initial uh, presentations. And this was our case, uh, which we did in 2013, and we reported and published it in 2014 in uh, CAT and uh, cardiovascular interventions. Now, coming back to our case, so this is a 1400 grams uh, BLBW male baby and 34 week gestation. And he was one of the twins and he was delivered in our hospital, not diagnosed earlier in antenatally. So it was around three years back in April 2017. The room air saturation uh, after birth was 85%, so echo was done. We showed a single ventricle physiology with the duct-dependent uh, pulmonary circulation. And second twin echo was normal. So uh, we took the, uh, we counseled the parents about the complex cardiac condition and uh, the probable need of multiple high-risk interventions in future. And uh, because India financial uh, I think is a very huge burden on the parents. So we discussed in detail that the patient might require many more interventions and we might be might not, not be able to give him a normal life also. But parents agreed for everything. Saturation slowly started falling. So we started prostin. And in the meantime, baby developed respiratory distress and respiratory secretions were there. And respiratory secretions showed acinetobacter, which was treated we did not do uh, anything on 1400 grams baby because it, it was too small for doing any procedure. So we kept waiting for six weeks. We start, we, we had given prostin and when the baby was 1900 grams, so intervention was planned because uh, we have done many interventions uh, at this weight around two kg weight. So we were comfortable at this weight. So parents uh, were discussed about detail, uh, whether to go for a BT shunt or a PDS stenting pros and cons were discussed. And after discussing, PDS stenting was planned. We performed the PDS stenting through right carotid artery rexus. And we usually take all the our punctures through USG guided punctures. And this is a habit since the last three, four years. And we have seen excellent results with USG guided punctures. 4F short sheet was placed and then everything was straight forward because we could state the we could place the stent directly through the 4F short sheet without use of any uh, guiding catheter. The patient was discharged on dual antiplatelets. At the age of six months, patient underwent right BD gland. The patient was not on very regular follow-up, but the baby was cyanotic with saturation around 60 to 70 percent, and left coronary artery was small on echo. So at around 2.5 years of age, his weight was 10 kg. Uh, we did CT and Joe, which showed LPA, which showed LPA was uniformly hypoplastic. Size of LPA was barely 2.2 millimeter. RPA was good size. The patient was planned for LPA stenting. So we planned the procedure in two steps. The first plan was to use a five or six millimeter cook formula stent and to redilate it further in future. So this is the anatomy. Sorry. This is the anatomy of the, this, we can see the LPA is very small, it's barely visible. And we crossed it with wire and placed our wire in distal lower part of the LPA. And through 5F, 5F sheet, we took the 5F sheet and placed the stand. This is the stand, we dilated it up to 5 millimeter. The right upper branch was already very small. 
previously also it was small so we didn't do anything with the right upper branch patient was discharged on aspirin and warfarin he was kept on close follow up maintained saturation at around 75% four months later we decided to redilate this stent then the stent was redilated with 8 mm zmed balloon this is the left upper branch which we did not touch it is same as usual, as before and this is the final picture of our lpa saturation of follow up after say about 2 weeks increased to 85 to 88% and i did this procedure last month only there is a plan to give warfarin for 6 months along with continuation of aspirin the key points is in my opinion proper planning of procedure is more important than execution of procedure all the plans including handling of complications in such a small baby should be ready before taking a small baby to the cath lab surgeon should always be at our side and he should be ready to handle our complications if we can avoid multiple surgeries in such cases then it is always good for the patient this is my uh, uh, case case study which i published in indian heart journal in which there is a study on stenting of uh, pda in preterm babies of low birth weight babies less than 2 kg we studied procedure safety feasibility and results this was published in 2018 thank you thanks a lot one comment uh this four friends sit in a 1.9 kilo child um did it cause any harm no sir patient was absolutely fine i have done around 30 cases uh, in uh, babies from carotid artery but not so everybody was not so small but in less than 2 kg i have done around 6 or 7 cases all are doing well sir another question from a personal i mean a comment from a personal experience is that i had a child about 8 uh, months old and uh, had a glen by one of the surgeons of india and then uh, this patient presented to us with a, in a very bad shape with uh, head swelling sv uh, symptoms and then <clears throat> when we took the uh pressures the svc pressure was pretty high and uh, exact numbers i don't remember at the moment because this was done in 2003 or 4 and then uh, so uh, i spoke to that particular surgeon and we found that in the ngo the lp was pretty small but the patient was only 8 uh, months old so i spoke to the surgeon what to do he said to just to bail out the situation go ahead and uh, stent that uh, left pulmonary artery so i did that but then the problems were okay immediate but then uh, this child is now about uh, 10 years old 10 to 11 years old probably or slightly more than that but then he is behaving very badly i mean he is uh, that time we had put a 7 mm stent as well as i remember but then that was obviously inadequate for the child as he grew up and uh, it is very difficult now he has developed collateral so all over his chest and uh, has very limited exercise capacity and is not doing well so putting stents in very small children do, does carry a uh, risk uh, the problem uh, thank you. Thank you. here is uh, it's a horrendous disease um if you've got multiple complex uh, lesions left mm -hmm. pulmonary artery in particular is very unpredictable if you're faced with a baby with a very small left pulmonary artery maybe multiple stenoses you really if you're committed to do anything it will involve repeated procedures that could be one stent that you have to keep redilating and sometimes multiple stents so you and the problem then is that you cannot predict what will happen to the distal pulmonary artery vasculature whether it will uh, grow with proximal stenting or not so it's a bit depressing okay 
Uh, one question from the chat box, Dr. Gaurav. How do you give a manual compression for carotid artery in children who are less than 2 kilogram after you remove the percutaneous sheath? Sir, we do it usually just like we do it for femoral. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Dr. Saurabh. Dr. Saurabhi from Udhapur uh, Mission Thanks Hospital uh, has got some interesting case. Please go ahead, Dr. Saurabhi. Hello, am I audible, sir? Very well. Very, very yeah. well. Uh, um, good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank LifeTech for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of such an august audience. Uh, today, I'd like to present a case of transcatheter closure of ASD and levoatriocardinal vein. The story began with a six-year-old female child who came to us referred on detection of murmur during a school health exam. We examined her and we found that she had cardiomegaly with a white split second heart sound and a grade 2 ejection systolic murmur. Other systems were unremarkable on examination. We did a chest x-ray and we found that she had cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary blood flow. Her ECG showed a sinus rhythm with a right axis, a right atrial enlargement, and a right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, we did the echo in the child, uh, hoping to get an ASD. And as such, we got an ASD, which measured 9 into 7 millimeter with good rims all over. She had a dilated right atrium and right ventricle. There was no right ventricular outflow obstruction. Nor all the four pulmonary veins appeared to drain into the LA unobstructed. There was no left ventricular inflow or outflow obstruction, no coarctation of the aorta. Uh, when we interrogated her in the suprasternal view, we could see that there was an anomalous venous uh, connection coming up from the pulmonary veins joining into the innominate vein. Now, this was a flow which was coming from the left superior pulmonary vein. But on echocardiography, we could not actually demonstrate the course of this vessel we thought that it would be a single venous anomalous drainage. At this point of time, we discussed the entire uh, findings with the family of the patient. She was a girl child and the family did not want to go for a surgical correction because she would have a scar. So then we contemplated that we would go ahead and close the ASD uh, by transcatheter uh, method and we would leave the single venous um, anomalous flow as such. But before taking the child to the cat lab, we planned that we would do a CT scan of the patient in order to see the anatomy, which was not very clear to us in book. So uh, when we did a CT scan for the patient, I'm sorry, I'm not presenting the exact CT of the patient. This is a similar CT which I've taken from the net. We found that this anomalous drainage was actually a levoatriocardinal vein. And this was measuring five millimeter in diameter. I've made a pictorial de depiction where we could see exactly that the left upper pulmonary vein and the left lower pulmonary vein were forming a common chamber and then it was draining via the levoatriocardinal vein into the left innominate vein. Now we did some research regarding the embryology and also literature available. We found that this levoatriocardinal vein was actually the embryological remnant of the splanchnic venous system, which is normally found in the fetus. And this splanchnic venous system actually connects the developing pulmonary veins with the systemic anterior cardinal veins. Now, this vein is supposed to disappear after the child is delivered. But on certain rare occasions, when there is a left-sided inflow or outflow obstruction, these veins may persist. But in our case, this patient did not have any left ventricular inflow or outflow obstruction. Ch children usually with a uh, left-sided hypoplastic heart have uh, with a restricted um, PFO have these um, levocardinal vein uh, persisting as an egress to the normal pulmonary venous drainage. But our case was unique because uh, apart from the small ostium secundum defect, the child did not have any other cardiac anomaly. There were multiple case reports from India and uh, some centers outside which had depicted that uh, a levoatriocardinal vein could persist with simple left to right shunts and could be responsible for pulmonary arterial hypertension also. Fujiyama et al. had also shown that they had a case with tetralogy of fallow where there was the persistence of a levoatriocardinal vein. So now with um, the CT 
in hand and uh, proper planning how we would close off both the shunts in case there was no um, rise of pressure in the left side of chamber we took the patient to the cath lab we did a qpqs calculation prior to closing the asd which came out to be 1.7 is to 1 then we took pressures in all the four chambers. The left atrial mean pressure was around 6 millimeters of mercury and the LV EDP was 8 millimeters. So uh, this is the hemodynamic data. Following this, we closed off the ASD using a uh, Amplatzer septal occluder 10 millimeter size. Now post closure of the ASD, we actually took pressures of all the four chambers again. We entered into the LA via the levoatrio cardinal vein and took direct LA pressure. So we saw that there was no significant increase in the LV EDP, nor there was an increase in the LA pressure. Post procedure of ASD, we also did a QPQS estimation, which came out to be 1.46 uh, is to 1. So now, uh, with these hemodynamic data, we went on to close the levoatrio cardinal vein. But the thing that um, the exact uh, position where we had to close off the defect was critical because we had to close it somewhere here so that we do not block the uh, brachial uh, drainage from any part or the left uh, innominate vein. So this is the uh, angio which is demonstrating the levoatrio cardinal vein. And finally, after doing uh, repeated angios, we located the exact site where we, would, we could close off the levoatrio cardinal vein using an amplasma vascular plug, size 10. So this is the angio which is showing that there is a normal innominate drainage. I'm sorry, I couldn't provide the final angio where we actually injected into the RV and we saw the four pulmonary veins entering into the LA in the levo fields. So this is our final um, outcome where we closed off the ostium secundum ASD and the levo atrio cardinal vein. Now this child is on follow-up with us. We have had two follow-ups. She's doing well. Uh, at the end of six months, we are planning to do a CT scan. She's kept on uh, aspirin for six months duration. So our scenario at present is the ASD device is here and the uh, levoatrio cardinal vein has been closed off with a vascular plug and all the other venous drainage have not been heard. So before uh, ending, I would just like to summarize some of the mimics of this particular anatomical variant, which can be a persistent left superior vena cava, a vertical vein in case of anomalous pulmonary venous return and left superior intercostal vein. All of these veins usually drain in the kefala direction, except the uh, left superior vena cava, which has a caudal direction of flow. Uh, my take-home message would be that levoatrio cardinal vein is a common association with left heart obstructive lesion with a restrictive intraatrial communication. Incidence in structurally normal heart is known and has been reported. Some patients have also demonstrated pulmonary arterial hypertension with this structure alone. Transcatheter closure may be required in elderly to prevent paradoxical embolism. Rarely, it may be associated with common left to right shunts, as was in our case, and reported in a case uh, from uh, Narayan Hridalaya, Bang Bangalore. And this entity requires meticulous investigation and management. Uh, thank you from the cardiac team, Mission Hospital, Dukapu. Thank you very much, Dr. Saurabhi. It was a nice case. In fact, you could have closed it from the uh, right atrium through the ASD into the left atrium and put in the catheter directly into that left vertical levoatrio cardinal vein and closed it also. Because sometimes it is difficult to take the curve and then the, sometimes the device will fling out. It's an excellent case. It's, it's wonderful. And uh, uh, it's, I'm not finding any more questions in the chat box. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shaq, do you have any questions? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, that was a very good case example as well. So um, that sometimes the decision making, and it depends on the age, is whether you close both defects in one procedure or whether you do one, uh, wait for a few weeks or months and then close the other uh, because you don't know how the hemodynamics are going to behave. Uh, that decision making is more important if you come across this combination in older patients. Whereas in children, it should be okay to close both at the same time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
and uh, we have uh, dr uh, nurul from uh, uh, bengal west bengal uh, who is ready with uh, his uh, next presentation dr nurul yes sir please nurul your slides you can share your screen and uh, yes shatta can you help me please yes yeah, sir if you go down there is a share screen box in the middle green color button yeah yeah just click on it and then you will see a powerpoint presentation go yes sir okay. yes sir i have yeah, yes right. how you are seeing yeah we are able to see it okay sir go to slide show and then yes sir so good evening everyone my seniors colleagues teachers and my dear friends first i would like to thank professor shak giving me the opportunity to be in uk uh, for observership and i had the opportunity to see the first case of sinus venosus asd uh, trans catheter closure in evelina children hospital in the next couple of minutes i would like to share my experience in a remote center with limited resources that is the perforation of the pulmonary valve in a case of uh, pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum it's very not common or uncommon also incidence like 0.7 to 3.1 percent and the standard mode of treatment radio frequency perforation which are done uh, center for the uh, facilities available but sometimes you might need to take a call for you have very limited resources but as interventional cardiologist you like to do the procedure or take the challenge in real life so we had a case like six months old baby with uh, hypoplastic uh, right ventricle with smallest tricuspid valve annulus with a jet score of minus 1.12 and there was a membranous pulmonary atresia no anterior flow and the baby was surviving on a tiny pda so we plan to go for the intervention in the cath lab pulmonary valve perforation but again the limitation you do not have much catheter or the hardware as you expect for a pediatric cardiologist so we have done the angiogram on the anterior ap view and we took the catheter in the right ventricular outflow tract to profile the rvot and the pulmonary valve annulus size at the same time we took simultaneous venous that is the rv and the aortic angiogram to profile the anatomy and the alignment of the valve with the rvot then we planned to take go for anterior way took the catheter that is the mp1 catheter and the coronary wire that is the chronic total ocular cto wire so once the wire is crossed i thought it's crossed the pulmonary valve and immediately i give by the side uh, port injection it, there was staining so i thought the rvot got injured by causing the staining but after little maneuver the wire entered further more but i was scared after giving the injection there was complete die going into the pericardial space then thought i did some mistake so i have to be very careful i did immediate echocardiography on table and there is a significant pericardial effusion but hemodynamic the child was stable on intubation ventilation so i waited for another 10 15 minutes whether it is going to increase or not but hopefully there is no further increase in the pericardial connection or there is no deterioration of the hemodynamic study so after discussing with my adult colleagues i uh, started the proce procedure again this time after we went through the atrial there is a retrograde way and profile the pulmonary valve it was little bit thickened but the catheter was not taking the proper position where i wanted to perforate the central part but in spite of all this i took the challenge i thought i can do with the hard end of the coronary or cto or and i perforated and it was confirmed on echo uh, that it crossed the pulmonary valve and there is a sudden jerky movement helped to cross the thickened pulmonary valve and immediately confirmed on echo that the valve is crossed by the or so it was little bit comfortable for me but and then i started taking the smaller size of the coronary balloon from 2 mm to 4.5 mm gradual dilatation so that i can pass the catheter easily but after this when i cross the catheter and through the catheter i took a 35 teromo or it entered into the pericardial space so again i did some other mistake so again the situation is little bit complicated but 
we need to take out the baby out of lab safely. That was the target. So I didn't remove the catheter retrogradely. It's placed, kept in situ without changing the position if any perforation done. So I went through anti-grade way and frost the pulmonary valve with the coronary wire along with the terum wire. And terum wire taken out, the coronary wire placed in the right lower nerve branch and over the wire we took like two, two millimeter coronary balloon followed by 4.5 millimeter coronary balloon inflation. And after that, I took six into 20 millimeter tie stack balloon to final dilatation. And after this angioplasty, I did the angiogram in the RV cavity. It is very hypoplastic RV cavity, muscle hypertrophy and significant tricuspid regurgitation, but anterior flow after the angioplasty quite satisfactory. Immediate post-procedure angio echocardiography showed good amount of the integrated flow across the pulmonary valve with significant gradient but saturation of the child improved to satisfactory level. And after this, I took the final angiogram from the RV and showing good anti flow across the pulmonary valve with bilateral branch PA showing, but a little bit hypoplastic. I kept this catheter, which is taken from the arterial side for another 10, 15 minutes. There is no further increment in the pericardial collection. And I was mentally prepared. When I take the catheter out, there might be recollection or increase in the collection but luckily it didn't happen. So we removed all the catheter. Patient got discharged after six days of the procedure without any complication. At follow up three months of age, the amount of the TR volume has decreased significantly. And there is a good amount of the anti flow from the pulmonary valve across the bilateral branch pulmonary arteries. So during this last two years, almost we have done six cases of pulmonary valve perforation for small babies to so almost 10 months old babies and we used always there is a gradual dilatation and perforation uh, retrograde way and mostly in the anterior way and there was this significant complication happened for this baby but luckily we saved the baby and all patients are under follow-up with all those routine parameters which will help to uh, plan whether this child go for single ventricle or ventricular repair and this procedure was done under general anesthesia. No baby required any doctor stenting during the post procedure and discharge without uh, with medication like beta blocker and sometimes low dose of diuretics. And the patients are on regular follow up. And one patient might go for only some PDA device closure because the valve was nicely opened and there is a good amount of saturation. But we have to wait for final result. Thank you so much. No, 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 I have a comment. When yes, you are uh, doing a perforation of a very uh, stenotic pulmonary valve, mm -hmm. then uh, there is uh, an interesting phenomenon that immediately the uh, saturation does increase and the baby becomes stable. But over the days, there is again desaturation. So some authors recommended that why don't you do a uh, ductal stenting in the same sitting? Again, the sir, question is, as in the previous discussion regarding the economy and the finance, when the ductal stenting, it can help to increase the pulmonary blood flow and improve in saturation. But in this case, we have seen the anti flow is after establishment of the anti flow, the saturation was quite happy and on follow-up. And but as per from my experience in these six cases, I have seen when given beta blocker to some extent, hypertrophy infundibulum regresses or there is desaturation to significant amount uh, which can uh, require the further intervention I didn't face. But we have to be mentally prepared if the facility and the finance is available, always better to go for doctor center. I've got a comment um, to make as well, and that is related to the perforation. As a general rule, if we are perforating from a wide lumen to a smaller lumen, uh, there's a high chance of complications. And so if you're going, for example, in this case, from a pulmonary artery that's bigger than the right ventricular outflow tract, and you try and perforate, the likelihood is that you'll go uh, into the sinuses because the catheter will be pushed anterior. So you'll go into the sinuses and perforate out into the pericardial space. So as a rule, I would still persevere with RV outflow tract perforation into the pulmonary artery rather than retrograde. Okay, sir. Thank you.
Yeah, and one more comment is that once you have perforated the pulmonary valve, you are happy, and then these uh, imperforate, imperforate pulmonary valves have the tendency to again uh, become uh, short. I mean, small as the time goes by. So that's what I was telling. It is always better to do a ductal standing if the funds permit. And, uh, sort out the situation at the moment. Thank you, sir. Dr. Lalit? Yeah, yeah uh, good evening to all. Uh, am I audible and slides are visible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks one a minute. lot, sir. To one minute. Shiva Kumar, sir, we are, I have unmuted you. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, go, go ahead, Dr. Lalit. We are looking forward to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, all learned masters, uh, to giving me the, for giving me the opportunity to present. I found these two cases will be the interesting. So, first case is. I think the slides are not moving. Uh, sir, you can go to the go to the slideshow slide more. Uh, go yeah, to the slideshow. Come down to the yeah, bottom of the torch yeah. bar. The normal. Uh, slide. You can even press from there, sir. Right. Hmm. Yeah. When I go to the. Uh, the I start from the beginning. Press. Yeah. So the same thing from beginning. You just go and slide click on the area. From beginning. Yeah. yeah. Go to the next. Yeah, but now I cannot see. Yeah, the now video. it's fine. No. It's uh, am I visible? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, first case is uh, seventeen years old girl with the infant one year. Uh, she was found to be the hypertension and started on some medications for the hypertension since last ten months. Actually, this patient has been referred to me from my adult cardiologist uh, colleague, and there was also history of previous surgical ligation done. At the age of four years, and again there was found to have some residual shunt, which was uh, thought to be closed by the device. At the age of nine years, the device closure has been done, and uh, obviously I do not have any images or the records of that uh, previous procedures as it was done outside. So when I have seen the issue of this girl, uh, it showed the uh, somewhat LV hypertrophy with the mild mitral regurgitation. Co-optation of aorta gradient showing some 65 millimeters of mercury with the diastolic pan diastolic filling, and with the narrowest uh, co-optation segment diameter was around 4 millimeters, and while the transverse arch was of 16 millimeters. So if you can see this uh, here exactly, uh, this is the upper edge of the device. The aortic rim is protruding into the aorta and causing a significant obstruction up to 40 to 50 percent. And at the same time, if we look carefully, this the another edge from the posterior shelf-like thing is protruding towards the lumen. So there is a significant obstruction, and uh, same the mitral regurgitation and all other issues. Then uh, on the angiogram also we have confirmed the same thing, and we did the co-optation of aorta stenting using the uncovered andra stent, uh, and with the help of the pacing, as uh, you can see the. Uh, it was not a very tight lesion, very tight stenosis. So in this case, as a protocol, we prefer with the going with the cardiac pacing. As in case of the tight lesions, tightly stenosed lesions, we can see there may not be any lesion of the cardiac pacing where the chances of stent embolization are very less. The choice for giving the uncovered stent is, uh, of course, the cost only to save some amount of money. Uh, this was the post procedure uh, echo, which showed the. Uh, uh, no gradient, no significant gradient, just around 18 to 20 millimeters without any diastolic filling, no mitral regurgitation. Stent and everything was in perfectly position. And luckily, we found that after two to three months, the hypertension has uh, normalized and we could stop our antihypertensive medications also. Uh, coming to the summary of this case, the, uh, in this case, as we have seen, the co optation has presented after eight years of the PDA device closure. Uh, is it a device oversize at that point of time or that the tendency of the arch itself as the shelf was there, uh, we do not know, or all like a contributing factors which makes us more uh, learned persons so that in a uh, PDA device closures, we should be give a thought upon the how much the, as we uh, always discuss about these things, how much the uh, obstruction of the aorta is permissible and not only the immediate, the long term also we have to look into this matter. The next case is, it is a preterm baby, 
uh, which uh, born at the 31 weeks of the gestational age with the birth weight of 1 kg and 30 gram and 950 gram around 10th or 13th day of life uh, the baby was hospitalized in the nicu for the preterm care on day 3rd of life i did the uh, echo cardiogram we showed a just a small pdi less than 1 mm with the prominent shelf in the arch with somewhat narrowing there was no evidence of obstruction of that point of time the normal function no mitral regurgitation uh, sorry that no pdi is uh, by mistake has been added so prominent shelf has made us vigilant and we have seen this also in many of the cases uh, in the early echo in the neonates or the preterm if there is a prominent shelf we keep this baby on the radar for the targeted uh, lower limb saturation and pulses even if they have been discharged from home so same thing has happened so in this baby also we have kept this baby on the regular follow up in the nic also with the monitoring of the femoral pulses and one probe uh, executed only for the lower limb saturation around 10th day the baby has started showing some symptoms like food intolerance and weak femorals immediately as we have prepared for this we did the echo immediately it showed the discrete coarctation of aorta mild mitral regurgitation and uh, there was a, around the gradient of 40 to 50 mm of mercury with the pan diastolic filling and you can see this how the lesion is there was some flow to that quite uh, so this now the 950 gram weight at the on day 10th or 13th of life and with this the baby only two options as all of us know needs to be corrected surgery or big procedure you have the baby has some chances of complications in such a tiny baby not only the complications chances of recurrence in case of the balloon as well as in the surgery so as a pre op evaluation the neurosonogram was done to show the grade 1 hemorrhage according to the neonatologist which has been seems to have a good prognosis grade 1 hemorrhage will not have any intracranial grade 1 hemorrhage will not have any uh, sequelae in the future life so lot of discussion with the family in keeping view of the small baby and all the procedure related problems so we have uh, the uh, the family has opted for the balloon coxoplasty and uh, it took almost two days 48 hours for the family to decide whether to continue the treatment or not to continue whether to go for the procedure or not by that time the baby we have made our arrangements and the baby also had showing the worsening symptoms the rising lactate urine output was decreasing decreasing baby was intubated and on ventilator support finally the parents made up the mind and with this uh, the thought process of the uh, we have kept in the mind the weight of the baby is 950 grams what access to be taken whether it is a femoral axillary or the carotid surgical help for the access the arterial sheath whether we can get the three french sheath or not the catheter for the angiogram then crossing the lesion if we have opted for the femoral access the crossing the lesion from the femoral uh, are we going to be succeeded or not then uh, the uh, size was around 4 to 4.5 mm the transverse arch as well as the thoracic uh, aorta at the diaphragm level so we have opted for the 5 by 20 uh, minute ischemic balloon and not only this the procedure should be finished within minutes uh, keeping uh, in mind that the arterial sheet is going to be there preterm baby with the 950 grams of weight minimal di quantity renal problems and of course uh, not last but the least it is the hypothermia prevention so uh, by the time we get the three from the balton we have got the three french sheet we have arranged it and by around night around 11:30 this baby has been shifted to the cath lab uh, lucky to be on that day got a femoral access within the first trick otherwise we would have the option to keep the surgical open the femoral why the femoral artery was been chosen i had a uh, catastrophic event with the small baby 1500 grammer baby for the carotid access for the ductal stenting just two to three days before this so i was annoyed with that and uh, uh, made my mind to go with the conventional of the femoral though it could have been the disastrous in this baby so uh, only the advantage was i got the three french sheet so i have there to go ahead heparin uh, given the half dose the 50 international units and not only got the access in time but uh, was able to cross the lesion also in the short time and i also i did not do any uh, obviously there was no three french catheter available with me so the, with the balloon only i have done only one angiogram with the only one ml of the di diluted dye finish the procedure the total time on table was less than 20 minutes sheet made out immediately after taking out the tie shack balloon 
and postoperatively they were shifted into the MSU. This was the only angiogram. If you can see, the balloon has been. Uh, it was the maximum uh, eco-guided procedure. Only the balloon has been uh, kept here, and through that, the angiogram has been done to see yes, the carotids are there, and this might be the uh, patient site. And with the waist guided, the second the balloon has been inflated, and the procedure has been done. The uh, pre-procedure, the uh, patients were not. Uh, Uh, taken just to uh, save the time. Post procedure, there was no significant gradient, so immediately came out uh, sheath as well as the outcome. So got one battle over, but something was bitting us <coughs> the bigger complication for us. So baby was shifted to the NICU. The right lower limb pulse was not palpable. Pulse ox meter should not did not show any kind of waveform. In next 30 minutes, the soul was started turning blue. at that point of time uh, the life was misery i thought i got a read of coaptation of aorta in the baby at the cost of limb what if this is going to get progressive progressively increasing to start the heparin infusion or not if i start the heparin infusion what will happen to the cns bleed what will be the neurological uh, outcome in this baby and from our neurologist friends we always learn this that the, in case of a it is not the survival or the successful procedure is not only the success but giving a neurologically sound baby in the future life is the ultimate aim for us so with lot of you can see here in this the right lower limb has been given some of uh, limb elevation and the soul has been started turning blue with the pulse oximeter prove on that so with this uh, lot of discussion and on the conclusion finally i have started the heparin infusion at the 20 international units per kg after 1 hour i got some uh, form of uh, improvement in the pulse oximeter waveform so the uh, dose has been decreased to the 10 and around 5 to 6 hours the baby got the color back to the normal right lower limb and we got a sigh of relief and after 24 hours the baby was extubated in next uh, 7 to 2 hours neurosonogram was did show only the grade 1 bleed no increase in that so approximately around all the preterm protocols and all that thing has been taken care and around post procedure 25 days baby has been sent home with the weight of around 1300 grams so this was the post procedure echo which is showing no uh, mitral regurgitation and uh, uh, there was no uh, significant restenosis also another this was the worrisome for me yes yes done Uh, then there was uh, uh, no diastolic spilling, and this was after the six months of the post procedure uh, echo. We showed still there is no restenosis, no mitral regurgitation, and everything was uh, perfectly going on. By this time, the baby has weighed around 4.5 to 5 kg weight and doing excellent. If in the neonate, maybe the marker for the progression to the coaptation of aorta. Uh, from our radiology or the, from the fetal echo studies, we have seen the uh, persistence of the left SVC uh, with the shelf sign in the arch of aorta. Almost all, uh, up to 50 percent of this baby may go progress to the coaptation of aorta. Though the literature says up to the 20 percent, but we have seen that uh, it, if not at the birth, maybe after five to six days of life, and uh, if not then, maybe around one and a half months of the life may get this coaptation of aorta in this. So these are the babies should not be left without any uh, uh, follow-up echo protocol. And balloon coaptoplasty is not uh, just a rescue procedure. in the infants of the preterm babies it can be sometimes more than a rescue which up to 7 to 8 months this procedure was been done in the july month and now uh, up to 8 to 9 months and baby is doing excellent without any restenosis so thank you all i had a uh, i have a comment uh, lalit uh, yes sir ha huh. this was a older older child and what you did was uh, i mean uh, in your first case in your where you had to put a stent in the pda i mean beside the pda device uh, yes sir this was an older child right yes 17 years uh, had a similar scenario in a very young child and probably you could have uh, done is uh, if the gradient like i have uh, two children with uh, the device uh, slightly slipped off 
and uh, this is near the gradient of about 40 to 50 and in one patient about 70 and i discussed it with, with several experts and uh, uh, they said that uh, you can go ahead and uh, and and just keep the child as it is and the aorta will grow radially. So that is another option which you can think about. Yeah, uh, sir, but the only thing uh, for going uh, against the conservative management, the patient was hypertensive and symptomatic as well also. Uh, mm. I was not very sure about whether I can put this uh, stent and how the future is going to be there as there is a obstruction is mechanical from one side because of the device. But as uh, it was done few years ago, four to five years ago, and uh, basically I got this idea from our Stentac on, uh, which has been organized in the Kolkata. That time I have discussed this case with Shiva sir also. So he also thought, uh, and he also already have been done in a post PDA device closure, the cooperation of aorta stenting, that it may not be give a problem for the stent with the device. And if uh, the we are running short of time, sir. Sorry, so sorry yeah. about it. Yeah, so that was the only Already intention exceeded. to complete. Thank you, case. thank you, Dr. Lalit. A nice case, yes. and in view of uh, shortage of time, very oh, unfortunate sorry. to to stop the discussion yes, now. Yes. Dr. Tanuja wants to tell all of us how we should act during this COVID emergency. Go ahead, Dr. Tanuja. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, hope I'm audible. Very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity to share our experience. I will be narrating how we at Kokila Ben or Tertiary Care managed a routine cardiac emergency in the face of a pandemic. So for elective cases, just like most of the institutes, we have also adopted the policy of doing a nasal swab PCR for a corona. And once the result is negative, we are going ahead with a routine case. However, for this case, we did not get the liberty of time and hence we were pushed to the wall to undertake the procedure with the following precautions. I also feel that this uh, presentation might be more relevant uh, for the Indian scenario and um, definitely the policies might differ on the international platform. So we were uh, facing a uh, six days old neonate with a diagnosis of transposition of great arteries with intact interventricular septum and the family hailed from containment zone in Mumbai with the highest numbers of COVID cases, that is the Dharavi slum. So step one of precaution should be that whenever you get such a call, you have to have a place to triage such patients. We received this patient in our a &E. Only one relative was asked to accompany in. That relative was given a mask and a sanitizer and belongings were kept out. So four mites have to be kept out. The sick status is identified and informed in the PCICU containment zone. So we have made a separate PCICU wherein we sort of receive suspected cases of corona. A nasal swab was sent from a &E and the baby was then received in the pediatric cardiac ICU where we had a pre-designated corona specific separate ICU from the main ICU. So ideally, this place should have a negative airflow ventilation with minimum 12 air changes as per uh, the ICMR guidelines. You have to designate the personals who are going to take care of this patient. And we initially thought that one nurse and two doctors would be enough, but we were mistaken. We required help of another nurse to make infusions as one nurse was busy with the respiratory care. So PPE at the first contact, we were given N95 mask, goggles, two sets of gloves, cap, and a gown. And you have to consider patient and relatives both to be corona positive each time you handle the baby. <clears throat> so the baby was sick. And with intubation and insertion. So, echo confirmed our diagnosis and had a very PFO with an intact interventricular septum with the usual coronaries and mild ventricular dysfunction. So, this was the echo at presentation. Very rapid rate. It was very tiny, and our lactates, our starting lactates, were 14.8 at 5:35 p.m. Our step number three. While in, we have a serious 
with all precautions. You go ahead with real attempt intubation. You have to refrain from suction or aerosol generating procedures. Equipments to be termed contaminated are you the use and throw once goes straight to the bin and not on the table. Stethoscope, laryngoscope, BP cuffs, saturation probes, uh, oxygen tubings, and the oxygen cylinder which you will be using to transfer the baby should not be shared. We avoided doing an x ray since we had only one portable x ray machine available for the floor. We used disposable laryngoscope blades, which are not very costly. Each blade costs around 240 rupees, and we had our disinfectants. Uh, pre-decided. So the, we used a rapid surface disinfectant for the fomites, uh, that is the table, stethoscope, etc. And sodium hypochlorite was used for floor, floor uh, cleaning. Step number five, you have to plan the shifting. So each of the three personnel removes the ICU PPE before leaving, puts on new gloves, gowns and masks over the N95. And once in cat lab, you have to remove the gowns and masks and you have to don the PPE, which is given in the cath lab. Now remember this donning takes nearly eight to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, with respect to the echo machine, we cannot share the echo machine, which you have used in the ICU to be dragged along and taken to the cath lab. So if possible, use two different echo machines. You have to plan the donning before you begin as you get only one kit. So many donning videos are available. However, it does get confusing, especially when your child is unstable. The most common questions which are asked and which ran through my head also were, does the lead apron go in or it remains over the suit? Where, when is the step where I do a surgical hand wash? And there are many such items available in the kit and which I did not pay attention to was a disposable bag, which you need to save till the end because you have to dispose your PP into that bag. What would ideally help and what we, I think we should do is put on a donning and a doffing poster in the changing room and remember to do a surgical hand wash in between. So this is what we followed and the practical issues which we faced. Firstly, inspect the PPE. You have to check for tears. Even while wearing, there is an instance where, you can, uh, where there can, can be a tear. So please do not hurry as you may breach it and you get only one PPE per person. You will need a chair. So Find one before scrubbing your hands. Please hydrate yourself as it gets very humid once you have done three layers and a lead apron. So the uh, sequence which you can follow is, first do the alcohol hand rub, put on your cap shoe cover, then do a surgical hand wash, then comes the gloves, the suit, the N95 mask, then goes the hood and a second pair of sterile gloves and over that you put on the lead apron and now remember you're already surgically hand washed so you cannot touch the lead apron and you will need a helper followed by a surgical gown so i in inadvertently touched the lead apron and i had to put on a third pair of gloves because we did not have time we had started with lactates of 14. what other time savers which uh, we did were um, we asked the uh, anesthetist to uh, take the puncture while I was donning the uh, gown. It becomes quite difficult to palpate the pulses with four layered suit and three layered gowns. So uh, all this took nearly an hour. And uh, in the uh, uh, beginning, we started with a single nurse, but uh, obviously we required two nurses, one to prepare the infusions, who can avoid coming in contact with the patient and she can prepare the infusions with a safe distance from the patient. Um, after shifting the child and before I was donning my PPE, the lactates had already risen to 19. So remember the time taken to be corona safe is going to be at least 20 to 30 minutes extra from what you would normally take. Uh, the bus was the simplest thing I thought. Uh, you have to uh, be careful uh, as to avoid splashing of any fluids, uh, not create any aerosols. Uh, the suit and the lead, lead apron uh, sort of uh, decreases your dexterity and the bus went on smoothly and after a few hours the lactates did come down. Uh, just a minute. Okay, my slides. Yeah, so this is our photo plus uh, after, after we've done the procedure and we were quite content, 
uh, with our procedure, you can see the uh, Dr. Anuj, who is our DNB fellow, and that is our anesthetist, Dr. Kiyur, and myself in between. And I was quite happy with myself, but uh, only to realize that the suit which I had done, um, if you can see the flap below my chin is not uh, very tight. I had not secured it tightly as compared to what Dr. Anuj has done. He has uh, extended the flap all over his chin to the other side. So you have to be careful to ensure that you have a tight seal. So you have to know your suit before you uh, sort of uh, start with it. And the goal of donning is to protect yourself from contamination. But the most difficult part, what I thought was doffing, that is getting the suit off. And you have to be careful that you do not spill any of the contents on yourself. So please go through donning doffing videos which your hospital may have provided you or the suit, uh, um, whatever suit they are giving you, please go through it before you go in for an emergency procedure. You will also realize that uh, concentrating on the donning and doffing, you are going to breach sterility of the procedure. So uh, try and pay more attention to that. Consider your suit to be contaminated and you do not want to spill it on yourself. You tend to make errors on the, uh, during the first time. Do not keep the lead aprons back on the stand because they have been worn um, above your donned suit. So they are exposed to uh, um, uh, infected fluids and aerosols. And avoid extubating the baby in cath lab unless you have a negative air suction in place. So in conclusion, uh, in elective cases, it is wiser to rule out coronary infection prior to infection intervention. In case of emergency, consider every case as COVID positive and take all precautions. Donning and doffing requires practice. In an emergency case, assume you will consume 30 minutes extra with the aim of being corona safe. Limit the number of personal fomites and the number of examinations you do on the baby. And remember, you are doing this not only to protect yourself, but also your contacts and your family members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanuja. That was wonderful. Any any uh, uh, comments, uh, Dr. Bharat? Or no, I think uh, no. I think uh, it's a great presentation. It's a learning. You know how uh, how you need to be really very very careful. And from point of view of everybody, from the point of view of patient, other patients, family, and your own family, and you yourself, I think it's a it's really an experience. It was worth sharing so that everybody knows how careful you need to be. Uh, I don't know. I I don't know whether you could do anything better than what you have done. Uh, I mean, Shaq can give his opinion whether anything better is done in London uh, as compared to what these guys have done. Dr. Saume, you can share your slide. Can we unmute Shaq, please? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can no, hear you. No, I, I think that was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, we are um, actually assuming every patient um, is COVID positive rather than waiting for tests. So, uh, but the donning and doffing, it really does take a lot of practice. And you're, you've emphasized all the important points. Uh, because each hospital, each um, center has provided video demonstrations, and it's not easy uh, to to get it right. So because you can uh, contaminate yourself very easily. So I think uh, it's important to rehearse, and it, then it's important to follow the instructions. So soon, doctors are going to be astronauts. Shaq. Yes. <laughs> yes. Dr. It's Sanji? not very comfortable at all uh, when you do this. Dr. Saumi, you can share your slides. Satya, is that the last uh, speaker? Yeah, that's a yeah. Next is the last one. Thank you. Dr. Share my slides. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Your slides are well seen. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I really thank the organizers and everybody present uh, for the opportunity which they've given me to talk in front of who's who and the doings of pediatric cardiology. This is regarding uh, complete transcatheter management of Scimitar syndrome. The story goes uh, similar to what Dr. Sauravi has presented. It's a 13 year old oh, school. Child. I'm sorry. Can I go Dr. on? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. 
Please go ahead. Uh, referred due to an incidentally detected murmur. Clinical examination showed no cyanosis. Epical impulse was just medial to the uh, intercostal space. Uh, auscultation showed a significant pre tricuspid left to right shunt. This was the first surprise. The x ray showed a dextroposed heart. Obviously, with a dextroposed heart and uh, with a uh, pre tricuspid left to right shunt and with the already diagnosis given, we thought it was a scimitar syndrome. I'm, I'm, I don't have the pre echo loops. The echo di uh, diagnosis was a scimitar syndrome with a large central ostium secondum ASD, which is shunting left to right. Anomalous drainage of right lower pulmonary vein to the IBCRA junction. The RAR we were dilated without any pulmonary hypertension. So a small thing on scimitar syndrome. Uh, scimitar syndrome, uh, it's only the scimitar vein which is a sign corner. It can or cannot have bronchopulmonary sequestrations, hypoplastic RPA and the collaterals. The management of scimitar syndrome is usually surgical because the right lower pulmonary vein needs to be uh, rooted to the LA. They can do it by baffling through the AST or they can create a venous baffle inside the IVC and divert it to the LA. This surgical management can be done in a single setting or can be a staged procedure. Transcatheter management in scimitar syndrome has been done only for particular components. Like if there is a stenosis at the pulmonary vein or IVC anastomosis, they do a pulmonary vein balloon dilatation or a stentic or coil closure of these iotopulmonary collaterals if they have caused any pulmonary hypertension or hemoptysis. So further investigation, we know that the child had scimitar syndrome. We wanted to demonstrate the PA pressures and knock off the collaterals uh, before we send the child to surgery. So the PA pressures were mean of 20 and uh, there was no gradient by pullback from uh, right lower pulmonary vein into the IVC. These are the saturations which showed a huge step up from the mixed venous into the PA. QPQS was almost like 2.3 is to 1. We thought, okay, fine, there is an ASD and there is a PA PVC so the, and collaterals also, so the QPQS can be explained. We did the angiograms. The first one we did was the pigtail angiogram of the iota. This was the second surprise. Usually in scimitar syndrome, there will be only one collateral which comes from the celiac axis. Here, there are three collaterals arising one each from the celiac artery, right hepatic and right renal artery. Like, okay, fine, it's okay. Once we uh, got, get to know all the anatomy, we can knock mm -hmm. these collaterals off and send the child for surgery. And then we had to do the RP angiogram to see how it was perfusing. The RPO was not significantly hypoplastic. The Z-scores was uh, like plus 0 0.3 for the child. And in the levo phase, something else was happening. The RUPV was draining into the LA, but here we were not very sure what it was. And this is it. This is the biggest surprise of all which we got. This is the selective injection of the right inferior pulmonary vein, which was draining into the scimitar. We entered it through the femoral vein, IVC and the pulmonary vein. The injection showed that the pulmonary vein was draining both into the IVC and there was a channel which was connecting this pulmonary vein again into the LA. As Dr. Sauruvi mentioned, uh, this we cannot call it a levoatrial cardinal vein even though it is connecting the LA. It is not connecting the cardinal system. This is connecting between the right lower pulmonary vein and the LA. There are reports of this vein which are called as a meandering right pulmonary vein. And uh, we sent the child for a CT scan to get an absolute anatomy of what it was. The first arrow mark shows the uh, scimitar vein and the origin of that right meandering pulmonary vein. This is the running picture of the CT. And this other thing is the bronchus. The right bronchus in uh, scimitar usually is said to have uh, hypoplasia and uh, right lower lobe will not be uh, per, I mean, ventilated. If there is no sequestration in this child and there is one small accessory hemidiaphragm on the right. So our final diagnosis became a scimitar syndrome, an unobstructed anomalous right pulmonary vein draining into the IBCRA junction with an additional meandering right pulmonary vein draining into the LA, good-sized RPA, large central ostium secondum ASD, no pulmonary hypertension, and multiple indirect iota pulmonary collaterals. Then we went back and uh, did some literature search. We have seen that uh, some case reports have been mentioned about the meandering right pulmonary vein. Some of them had collaterals also, but no one has mentioned an ASD also with it. So now we had a penny for thoughts. Can we venture doing an ASD device closure, collateral coil closure and RLPV rerouting because there is a dual drainage? In a single setting, we discussed among ourselves and then we thought, okay, fine, we can do it. So we ventured into it. Transcatheter complete correction. We have taken informed consent from the family. If the procedure was done under intravenous sedation, 
It was guided by transthoracic echocardiography. We have taken bilateral femoral and right femoral artery axis. First thing, the easy thing which we did was collateral coil closure. We entered each of the collateral with an uh, Judkin's right and the Termo combination and then we have knocked them off with the O3-5 coils. Post occlusion, there was no residual force. Next is our interesting part. We had to close the scimitar vein at the IVC junction. We had taken two femoral axes. Uh, the scimitar vein, in, scimitar vein was entered with, again with a Judkin's right and a Termo combination. Then we have changed it to a six French Mullins sheet. The neck of that scimitar vein to IVC junction measured on the CT was around 2.2 mm. So we decided that we can deploy a single disc device like the duct occluder one. We have deployed the duct occluder one after checking multiple angiograms and views, making sure that we have not compromised the circulation of that right lower pulmonary vein. We didn't release the device yet. We have just deployed the device. We kept it uh, just in the position because we had to do an ESP device closure also. We didn't want the device to get dislodged with the manipulations with our sheath during the ASD device closure. ASD device closure was straightforward, right femoral venous axis, classical approach. The ASD measured around 16 mm, so we closed it with an 18 mm sectal occluder. Once we have uh, deployed the, released the ASD device, we again checked whether our uh, pulmonary venous device was in the right position or not. We did a small wriggling maneuver to make sure that it was not coming back into the IVC. We, because we had the uh, luxury of having two access, we again did an angiogram to make sure that the IVC close were not obstructed and then release the device. So this is the final thing of the child. The child had an ASD device closure, multiple collateral coil closures, and the RLPV being rerouted uh, to the LA by closure of the communication with the IVC, everything in a single sitting. That is the pictorial representation of what the child had. Post-procedure, the child was discharged on third post-operative day on aspirin. At discharge, the ECG was sinus. We had a follow-up of six months with this child. The devices all were in good position with unobstructed IVC and right lower pulmonary veins closed. ECG was still in sinus. The transcatheter closure, as I said, is done only for components of scimitar syndrome. Iotopulmonary collaterals are addressed if there is any pulmonary hypertension or hemoptysis. Scimitar vein IVC has been stinted in cases of intractable pulmonary hypertension, especially in infants, as a bailout procedure. This is the follow-up imaging of the child. We can see the uh, uh, device at the scimitar and IVC junction sitting nicely, which didn't cause any obstruction to the uh, pulmonary venous connection into the LA. IVC, IVC flows were seen to be unobstructed. So as is the first patient in the literature, to the best of our knowledge, who underwent transcatheter management for all the components in a single sitting, the favorable factors being no bronchopulmonary sequestration, central ostium secondary ASD with good drinks, and the dual drainage of right lower pulmonary vein. Acknowledgements, patient and his family, and of course my family, whole team of pediatric cardiology, cardiology, cardiac surgery, and cardiac anesthesia team of Jaideva, postgraduates, cath lab technicians, nursing and supporting staff. Last but not the least, divine providence for letting all this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saumya. Nice presentation. <clears throat> Actually, scimitar syndrome is uh, broadly classified into scimitar syndrome where the pulmonary vein entirely drains into the inferior vena cava and scimitar variant where there is a combined drainage partially into the left atrium and partially uh, the inferior vena cava. In such scimitar variants, closure of this channel below the level of the communication has been described. Armed Force Medical College, Pune, described in Indian Heart Journal about seven, eight years ago. And there are a few more uh, centers which has also published on this. this uh, the, name, the name is not given as similar syndrome. It's called a similar variant, wherein you have a dual drainage. And as you rightly pointed out, in some of the patients, the communication between this abnormal pulmonary vein and the inferior vena cava will become very minuscule. And where the entire vein will be called as purely meandering pulmonary vein, where it goes down and then turns up and enters into the left atrium. Nice presentation. Nice. The, the, um, uh, entry into the inferior vena cava isn't always narrowed. Uh, I, I did one similar case about, I think it was about three years ago, where there was quite a good distance between the meandering vein to the left atrium and the uh, rest of it draining into the inferior vena cava, which was fairly big and needed an AVP2. I can't remember the details, but um, yeah, so it, it does vary. I've got another patient waiting after the COVID 
yeah, yeah the majority of these patients the the final entry point after the communicating vein will be smaller i remember dr aravind singh one of my colleague from nagpur who was working with me uh, wrote up one paper on the same thing and he presented in some other we have seen a few few publications of this on the same scimitar variants these are mm -hmm. wherein there is a dual drainage where you can the, the important lesson in this case shiva is mainly from point of view of diagnosis that this pulmonary vein had a dual drainage and therefore could be tackled in the cath lab you know exactly. doing the procedure per se is not that much technically demanding mm -hmm. as compared to making an appropriate uh, diagnosis and saying that this could be done in the cath lab because of these reasons actually now since a majority of the centers are resorting to ct pulmonary angiography the diagnosis is becoming more and more common nowadays whereas in the past it used to be diagnosed only after a pulmonary artery angiogram and when you see the levo phase and suddenly contrary to your expectation there is a vein that is going back into the left atrium so nowadays since majority of the institutions routinely employ ct scan in order to identify the extent of aortic collaterals as well as assess the extent of right lung hypoplasia it has become a common practice to diagnose this and the scimitar variants are increasingly but, being recognized but i think this is a rarity i have i must have seen uh, i must have seen uh, nearly uh, 80 100 scimitars i have never seen a case like this yeah uh, i think bharat you're right uh, uh, i've only got two of these um, patients one yeah. that we've done and one that's waiting uh, the point also is that um, um there may be others that we've missed because in the past Absolutely. we made a diagnosis of scimitar syndrome and then it was um if there was an intracardiac defect it was referred for surgery and if it was um uh collaterals they were uh, embolized um now what we do is if somebody mentions scimitar we ask the people doing the ct scan to specifically look for possibility of dual drainage and it's when you look uh, the most recent one we it, it hadn't been reported and i said well have a look for this um uh meandering vein and then it, it was uh, diagnosed okay no it is mainly presented uh, because of the uh, the technically it's a very easy case it's uh, mainly as bharat said that uh, we presented this case mainly to have the i mean pre component was done uh, fairly easily and as shiva said it's almost mandatory for each and every scimitar to undergo a ct so it is becoming i don't think we ever miss this kind of a variants in future yeah actually yeah, in fact it is nice to say that uh, one of the first report of a scimitar transcatheter closure was close to about 10 years ago published from our own country from arm force medical college pune i don't remember the author i think it was dr duggal uh, i'm i'm not very sure but but it was it was in our own country okay i think uh... all good things must come to an end so i think uh, this was the last of the webinars in this series of uh, transcatheter interventions in congenital heart disease learn from the masters i take this opportunity to thank satya usri and their team for arranging this wonderful webinar series of webinars and i must thank all our guests uh, on first day we had zahid then we had chetan then we had zia then today we have shack and many others from across uh, across the continents and different countries from our neighboring countries bangladesh pakistan then we had from bangkok we had from turkey malaysia and what have you so i wish all of you to stay safe and take care and i think with that we conclude this session thank you ladies and gentlemen special bharat can i thank yeah please go ahead thank you everyone can i thank everybody um, uh, you and shiva and satya for organizing it uh, and vishwajit uh, and nitin and everybody in fact and all the people who've signed in this is a this is the sort of thing that is likely to change our future in terms of uh, not the talk today but the concept of doing webinars uh, is going to change our way of uh, meetings in the future i'm sure Uh, so thank you to everybody and keep Jack, safe from Jack, this was it here. before just signing off i just want to ask you one small question is how younger a patient have you closed a sinus venous asd with a stent i haven't done one yet i've got a 14 year old waiting uh, i keep cautioning about going down to below 12 years of age because the patients have got 
quite a bit of growth to get through. A mid-teenage one is, uh, should be reaching near full growth. So we are still focusing on patients who are nearly fully grown rather than go to uh, small, smaller children. That is very interesting. How do you get such older patients in your country with such well, big tips? It, well, it, it's, uh, it is interesting because once we started um, the procedure, there are now adult patients that are being uh, picked up around the country, in the, around the UK, uh, who are now waiting for us uh, this. And those adults are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s. And so people are beginning to find them. That, it's, it just shows that um, how these defects have been missed over the years. And also, Biswajit, ASD is a silent disease all over the world. Yeah. Not only yeah, yeah. It, it is correct. It is correct. Yeah, it is silent all over. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. And I think, Satya, you can put an end to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Satya. Thank yes. you. Sir, I'm ending the meeting, sir. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, please. Thank you. All right. Thank you.